Today, I'm very pleased to have Amelie Godin with us today. She's an associate professor of agroecology in the Department of Plant Sciences at UC Davis. Her research aims to develop sustainable and resilient agroecosystems, which have biodiversity and ecosystem services as a basis for improvement. She teaches sustainable agro, agro ecosystem management, graduate level ecology and agriculture, and principles of horticulture and agronomy. She is the recipient of the New Innovator in Food and Agriculture Research Award from the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research. So welcome, Amelie, and thank you for taking time out of your day to join us virtually. We really appreciate it. Well, thanks for the invitation and thanks everyone for sharing your lunch break with me. Uh, it's good to see you, uh, see some familiar faces around. So uh, it's a real pleasure to, to be here. I was mentioning to Margaret that um, I don't do that many extension talk and, and, and speaking more directly to, to growers. So I'm really looking forward to these interactions and, and some of the questions you might have on, on the work and as we're crafting some way forwards uh, for, for this research. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. The talk is intended to be the part two of some of the knowledge that has been shared last week about plant defense mechanisms. So I won't, I won't really go into the details of plant defense mechanisms also because it's um, out of my area of expertise, but uh, mostly um, sharing with you today uh, some recent research um, exploring the potential of healthy soils um, and their leaving microbial communities um, in building up resistance to insect pest. And um, here, I want to acknowledge the contributors to this research, uh, mainly Liar Benwick and Jen Schmidt, Caitlin Peterson, who were um, students in my lab, uh, Richard Vanette and Claire Castile, who are um, professors at UC Davis and Cornell University in entomology and Scott and Brian Park, uh, who are here today, which makes me a little nervous because um, uh, basically this, this came up um, uh, as we were doing research together on, on, on Scott and Brian's um, operation. So I'm, I'm very proud to uh, have had this, this interaction and, and being able to um, carry this, this research through and, and, and going full circle right now by sharing results with, with all of you. Feel free to interrupt me if you have questions um, at, at, at any time, okay? <clears throat> so as I was mentioning, this research actually started uh, with an observation. Um, we came out uh, work with uh, Scott and, and Brian Park at Park Farming in Meridian. It was a beautiful sunny day in, in California. And we were sampling soils at that time to examine the potential of soil health uh, to build up crop resilience to water shortages. Scott had made an observation that he was able to delay the onset of his irrigation and cut his irrigation earlier in, in, the, in the summer. And that um, he was um, having observing gains in, in water use efficiencies. So we were there sampling um, at that time when Scott made um, an interesting observation, which we followed up across uh, various conversation. And his observation was that, well, um, my field is here and um, I have a friend um, who has a field of tomato not far from my field. And um, it's the same variety, but the same sort, but the same transplanting date. Um, but um, in my field, I observe a, a very low insect pest pressure. I haven't had need for insecticides. And in particular, I see fewer leaf hopper, um, which are a vector of the big curly top virus, which uh, has no cure of remediation once the tomato plant is infected. So it's mostly about um, um, decreasing attractiveness to the insect that might be carrying this, this virus. Now, I'm not an entomologist, um, but I thought that was very interesting. And so I got excited. Um, and uh, started to wonder uh, what causes reduction in this insect um, in this field. And so um, talked with a few people, uh, went to search the literature, 
And in fact, organic farmers often implement multiple strategies for insect pest management uh, that go through pest avoidance uh, by having longer rotation, more diverse rotation, thinking of the design of the system, uh, thinking around um, sanitation, residue management, um, varieties and seed quality, but also management of the gross environment, uh, fertility, water management, um, trap crops, mulches, et cetera, et cetera. All of this with, with the goal to decrease the need for direct treatments um, and their cost and labor, uh, their, the cost of the product and labor cost associated with it. And so um, when talking with um, organic farmers, we quickly realized that um, as a community, uh, you manage a, a variety of habitat and resources that are regulating natural pest control in time, in space, and across scale, so that the problem does not arise in the first place. Um, and this is kind of what I was trying to show here where um, in our agricultural system, even though we're highly disturbed and more simplified um, um, uh, agroecosystems compared to natural ecosystems, there's a lot of ecological interaction and in what we call traffic chains where one element feed on another, predation, antagonisms. And so providing uh, a variety of habitat and resources can allow uh, to strengthen some of those beneficial ecological interaction towards increasing pest control. So that was the premise. And so we started to devise a hypothesis being like, well, we have so many research in papers in the literature showing that organic agriculture promotes uh, natural pest control, that um, organic agriculture um, increase the diversity of functions we see in the landscape and biological pest control compared to conventional orchards. Um, a recent meta-analysis actually shown various lines of evidence that organic farming promotes pest control. And um, uh, some papers dive more in depth into um, the mechanism when it comes down to parasitoid diversity and landscape scale. So we started to develop this hypothesis that, well, what's happening in Scott's field? It's basically there's more biodiversity. He has more natural enemies thanks to uh, his management practices. And um, that leads to predation and antagonism that decrease uh, the amount of um, beet leaf hopper potentially carrying the beet curly top virus on, on his field. Again, I'm not an entomologist, so I tried to talk to my colleagues and get excited by this project so we can give some information back to, to Scott and Brian about the impact of their practices. So uh, we went and um, sweeped the field to look at insects. And um, we saw that in this field, in the organic field, there's actually way higher biodiversity when it comes down to um, um, insect, both uh, natural enemies and, and um, potential pests. But we saw no significant differences in relative abundance of the natural predator compared to um, the, the, the surrounding fields. So yes, there was higher biodiversity, but not necessarily um, a, a very high potential for top-down control of this insect pest. And so we went back to the drawing board and um, you know, thinking of what Scott and Brian have been doing over the last uh, uh, decades, which has been spending a lot of time, resources and thoughts um, on how to best build up their soil health. And that includes fostering of an active and diverse uh, microbial community and um, how they're thinking about harnessing benefits to decrease input needs, um, but also their, uh, to improve their sustainability outcomes uh, and the outcome of their operation. So a healthy soil is, is a soil that has adequate physical structure, which is here shown through um, a set of parameter aggregation, surface sealing, compaction, porosity, water movement, water retention, um, a set of um, chemical properties, so it needs to be chemically balanced in terms of pH, salts, and other micro and micronutrients, but also biological properties, and that goes across the soil food webs from macrofauna um, to those very tiny microorganisms. 
Um, and so uh, um, uh, Scott and Brian had spent a lot of time trying to jize up, as Scott would say, their, their uh, microbial communities. And it became an important part of how they manage, um, uh, uh, about, it became an important part of their um, approach to management. Okay. And so we started to wonder, well, what are the soil health outcome? Well, what's soil health looking like in this field? Um, and as I mentioned, uh, we were there to samples for another project. So we started to have this, this understanding of um, the state of the ecological state of, of their field. And so Scott, please, and Brian, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I lifted this from your lecture you gave to my class. And so they have um, an approach to management that um, um, Scott and Brian define as the nine C's, which includes having a, a legume and, and or more diverse uh, cover crop, um, diverse crop rotation, frequent uh, compost applications, um, management of cover residues um, to uh, maintain as much biomass in their field as possible, uh, thinking about conservation tillage, uh, precision traffic to avoid those, those um, compaction issue, but also keeping residues and organic biomass inputs. Um, Creator care, which comes, uh, which is mostly at the at a more landscape scale, field margin, trying to provide habitat for other potentially beneficial organisms. Um, thinking about conservating input, but also um, uh, um, having a broader approach to sustainability by uh, considering the, the care of their crew as well. So. We were um, uh, sampling for another project that we had funding through the Organic Farming Research Foundation. And so that, that gave us a, a, an idea of what, what, where their soils were at. And we saw that they had 65% more organic nitrogen than their conventional neighbors, that they have way more total carbon, that uh, they were close to 2.5% in organic matter, uh, which is more than half more than um, their conventional neighbor more CEC, more P, more K, but interestingly, a threefold increase in microbial biomass. So the amount of microbes that are in the soil were threefold more uh, higher than in this conventional neighboring field. Um, and they're more active um, among other things. And so often when we think about um, uh, insect pests and, and um, um, Sorry, when we think about insect pests and uh, pest control, we often focus on the above ground part of, of the plant and the landscape. But in reality, half of the plant is above ground and is connecting to the soil and soil house through their roots and what we call the rhizosphere. And this rhizosphere is actually a hot spot for interactions with soil microbiome. And it's a very interesting part of an agricultural system which has been understudied uh, for a very long time because we didn't have the tools um, to uh, be able to um, um, see what's going on um, in this rhizosphere. So what happens in the rhizosphere? Well, first, uh, the rhizosphere is, is the zone of influence of the roots uh, around the roots in the soil. And it's very complex to study because it's very thin and it's hard to entangle impact of the plants and impact of the microbes and how they communicate with each other. What happened in the rhizosphere um, is that the plant exudes some compounds, so organic acids, small molecules, even hormones, um, that are carbon and nutrient rich exudates. And that gives food to the microbes and um, also signal to the microbes and select microbes that the plant needs. So there's a very active communication here from the plant to the microbial community that has been fostered through management to recruit some of the guys that the plant uh, uh, might, some of the organisms that the plant might need. The roots also provide habitat, so they help with creating those small aggregates. Um, they open their tissues so that microbes can come in into the endosphere. So the rhizosphere is on the at the periphery. The endosphere are the microbes that are inside the roots, um, but they also or roots also provide um, um, some some potential for mass flow of water and nutrients toward the plant, which further feed the microbes. Um, in exchange 
from all that, the plant gets services um, from the microbial community. Can be protection against pathogens, uh, nutrient cycling, so making those nutrients that you might have in, in your compost, for instance, available to the plant. Um, we know that there's a hot spot of mineralization in the rhizosphere. Uh, it helps this rhizosphere and those microbes help provide soil contact and water transport, which is very important, especially in our irrigated landscape. Um, and it also helps sense, the plant sense its environment and trigger adaptive response. And that's kind of where um, we're going here in, in that um, it helps the plant kind of figure out what's going on around it and um, um, adapt through a variety of mechanisms. So um, what are the potential benefits of a healthy rhizosphere community? Well, um, those are some recent papers that I've started to put this together. And we see that um, through interaction in the rhizosphere, and that includes mycorrhizal fungi, rhizobium, but also all the bacteria, archaea, fungi, and other organisms that are hanging out there, can help with water acquisition, nutrient acquisition, as I mentioned, but also tolerance to abiotic stressor. We have more and more publication in the scientific literature linking specific microbes to drought tolerance, for instance, in grasses, um, but also extended immunity against biotic stressor. And um, now it's a very complex uh, environment because it has thousands of organisms in the rhizosphere and they constantly shift according to the signals that the plant is giving and, um, and uh, the environment it's experiencing. And so, and, and we also often think of the rhizosphere microbiome as a good, uh, you know, a good bunch of microbes, but uh, Johan Laveau always said, microbes by definition are bad. Um, and so, it, you know, they, they, want, they want to infect you, the parasites. So there's, there's bad microbes that cause plant disease. There are ugly microbes that uh, can contaminate food, but there's a large bunch of microbes that are actually good. Um, that, um, as I mentioned, can enhance tolerance to abiotic stress, help with growth and development, nutrient acquisition, protect against pathogen, but also potentially trigger immune responses. So um, we started to think a little bit in that project about roots, rhizosphere and microbes, and maybe something was going on below ground that was triggering this observation um, that basically Leaf Hopper didn't like Scott and Brian's tomatoes. Um, so we started to went and, and look at the microbes. And um, what you see on this graph is the diversity of microbes. So how dive, this is an index of how diverse are uh, this microbial community. And you have two boxes here. One is in the bulk uh, soil. So a soil that is not tightly attached to the plant. And this is the rhizosphere soil. So the soil that is just right here that we brush off the um, brush of the plant to sample. And this is the conventional field and this is the organic field. And so first observation, uh, if you just look at the bulk soil, definitely Scott's uh, uh, field has higher, higher uh, diversity. So there's more microbes in the bulk soil. Interestingly, in the rhizosphere, if you take a rhizosphere of a plant growing in an organic versus a conventional field, the diversity of microbes is not really different there. So the plant really acts as a selective filter, um, which is uh, a very interesting. Now, there's the same, there's the same diversity, so uh, numbers of individuals in a certain sample, but that doesn't mean that those individuals are the same, right? So we dug in a little bit further and sequenced those microbes. And bear with me here, we don't need to look at all the details, but what you see here are the bacteria and what you see here are the fungi. Um, and this allows us to look at the difference between communities. So if things are tightly together, clustering together, they're not very that different. And so in blue, you see the conventional soil, both shades of blue, and in orange, you see the two, shade, the two shades of orange are the organic soil. And you see that they really separate on those graphs, both in terms of um, bacteria and in terms of fungi community. So the, although we have a similar type or a similar measure of diversity, actually the, the, the organisms are completely different. 
um, in the conventional versus the organic soil. And uh, when we look at the bulk versus the rhizosphere, well, the community was not that that much different. They still clustered together. So that's what's kind of interesting. You can have the same amount of diversity, but the community might be different. So that comforted us in our idea taken together. Well, we have different microbial biomass. We have different microbial communities. Um, maybe um, we can uh, start building this hypothesis that soil microbes might be triggering a bottom-up control of plant defense, uh, namely salicylic acid, jasmonic acid, and you've heard about this last week. And that might trigger resistance, uh, a shift in resistance and shift in attractiveness to insect pests. And this is what in the literature is called induced systemic resistance. So we set up to study this. Um, and um, we were able to get all the science together um, to publish this paper, which I have shared with Margaret and, and, and Scott. It's unfortunately behind a massive paywall. Um, this is uh, unfortunately how science work these days. Um, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to share it with you and, and Margaret has it and, and Scott and Brian as well. Um, that where we actually show evidence that organic management in Scott and Brian's field, as well as in four other paired field sites across Yolo County, promotes natural pest control through altered plant resistance to insect, and that the soil and rhizosphere microbiomes are the main vector for that. I'm going to show you quickly a few data points to illustrate the potential here. So what we did, we needed a concept. Uh, you know, so no one thought that was a thing. Uh, when we started to come up with the idea uh, based on the literature that soil microbiome might be doing something and Scott and Brian were thinking around this line too. Uh, there was not that much evidence. It seemed a little bit of a stretch. So what we did is um, started to, with, uh, with a proof of concept experiment, which is most of the time how you start. We took um, soils from um, um, Scott's and uh, the, the park farming field and the conventional neighbor and extracted a soil slurry. So we put some soil, we put some water in it, made a little bit of mud. Um, it has soil, it had microbes, and we inoculated some plants that were growing on the steroid soil media in a growth chamber. So we added the microbes from the soil um, onto the plants and grew some tomato plants. And then we cat leaves from plants growing on the conventional micro or the organic microbes, put them in a little device. Let me show you my device. Um, I actually have it here, which is a very high tech device. Um, it's just a piece of plastic and you put a leaf here and a leaf there and you release some leaf hopper here and you let them be for 24 hours and see where they prefer to hang out. Do they prefer to go on the leaf grow of the plant growing with the microbe from the conventional field or the organic field? What did we see? Well, first, we thought that uh, the surviving number of the leaf hopper on the plants that were growing with the organic microbes were much lower. So they did not reproduce as much as when you had um, the microbes from the conventional field being added to, to the pot. Second, when we ask the, the, the hopper to choose between those two leaves on both sides of, of, of the tube here, when we had the microbes, um, they preferentially settled on um, the conventional. Oh, I don't have the figure legend here. Sorry about that. The blue is conventional and, um, uh, and the red is organic. Or maybe it's somewhere, maybe it will appear later. Um, so when we inoculated the plants, um, the, the leaf hopper basically preferentially liked to hang out on the conventionally uh, grown plant rather than the organic grown plant. Okay. And when we killed the microbes, so we autoclaved the soil slurry, so there was no microbes anymore, they were all dead, we lost the effects. So soil and mysosphere microbe had something to do with it. We repeated this experiment, um, I think a solid 20 times. So it has something to do with it. So then we were like, what, what about salicylic acid? What about jasmonic acid? What about those defense compounds? So 
when we inoculated with the live microbes in the conventional versus the organic, we saw that um, there was a spike in salicylic acid production in the plant. Um, and when we uh, didn't have any microbe, we killed the microbe by autoclaving the soil slurry, we lost the effect. Um, we didn't see any difference when it came down to jasmonic acid. That still wasn't proof enough, so we used some tomatoes that cannot produce salicylic acid, try to do the same assays, and um, uh, soon enough we were able to see that, well, um, as soon as you block the salicylic acid pathway in the plant, you actually don't have this effect anymore. So it had something to do with microbe, it had something to do with salicylic acid. How about jasmonic acid? We use the plant that cannot produce um, uh, or accumulate jasmonic acids, and we didn't see any significant differences between um, when we, we inoculated with the live slurry. So there was an active, active crosstalk uh, between um, uh, microbes and induction of salicylic acid that had something to, to do with this reduction in attractiveness to insect pests. Long story short, that was still in a gross chamber, so does that hold up across a diverse agricultural fields? Um, we went around UC Davis with, uh, and sampled four paired agricultural field sites that organic versus conventional, all in processing tomatoes from the same grower in general, try to be um, good at choosing fields with the same soil type, transplanting dates, et cetera. And um, we uh, did the same essays where we put leaves from the conventional versus organics as the leaf hopper to choose. And on the majority of farms, uh, it did. we did see the same impact. On the farm one, we didn't, but it, it, a caveat here was um, that that was soon transitioned to organic. So potentially the impacts weren't there yet. It was not a very good perch site, but you don't choose the data you like, you know, you have to keep all data, you cannot ditch the data you don't like. So this is what it is. So we saw fewer leafhoppers settling on organically managed tomato for most farm, um, multiple fields. So that was, um, um, you know, the pattern was, was holding up. What we did then was to sequence the microbiomes uh, was to model the microbial community. So see, well, what microbes are really important in shaping their communities. Um, we also measure all bunch of stuff in the field, um, soil health indicators, other plant indicators, plant nutrient, uh, biomass, hormones, throw all this in, in the pot and develop statistical model that look at uh, correlation, co-occurrence of different um, parameters together. So those are pretty complex model I won't go into, but basically you measure a whole bunch of stuff and uh, you just fit it into a statistical model that is gonna be like, hey, you know what? This always trend with that and I see a relationship between this and that. Um, so we did that. And, and ran various correlations. And so what did we find? Um, we found that leaf nutrients and salicylic acid across this large data set uh, were significantly associated with microbial community composition and leaf hopper preference, to put it in a nutshell. And we identified some microbes um, which are correlated with salicylic acid levels in organic production systems, and that we were not able to find to that extent in a conventionally managed system. And this include um, the actinobacteria. Now, correlation is far from causation. Um, so we still have a lot of digging in to do, but we do have some indication and I think um, some very interesting preliminary results pointing toward the soil microbiome being a significant part uh, and actor in pest control um, and in organic field and that we do not see any of those effects in conventionally managed fields. Now, I realize this is not super helpful to you organic growers because what you want to know is what should I do as an organic grower to manage for um, um, fostering those active microbiomes. Um, nonetheless, I think it's, it's just the tip of the iceberg and, and we can start uh, digging in a little further. So 
The next step and something we're working on are the mechanisms. Can we inform breeders into uh, developing tomatoes that are actually better at communicating with microbes? We see in some preliminary research that some of those um, heirloom varieties are better at this, are better at teaming up with microbes than more modern cultivars. What are the key practices? Um, we saw this effect across organic fields and across organic farms. Um, I think it has something to do with um, um, organic matter inputs and fostering, um, you know, giving food to those microbes and, and, and getting them um, um, active and, and diverse. But is there a key practice that is very important? This is something we cannot tell quite yet. But in any case, I think, and I, and, and I wanted to share this story in this way, because I think it's important for us researchers to realize that we need to keep in tune with you um, and that your observations are very valuable and they're drivers of science and, and we're grateful for that. And I think we would never have gone down this avenue if it wasn't for a conversation with, with Scott and Brian. And so um, it's very important for um, to, to keep those conversation and both uh, growers and researchers engage in some participatory research so that we can discover new things that might be of, of importance for sustainability and resilience. Um, in particular, when it comes down to soil microbiomes, we're just opening this box. There's a lot of unknowns. Uh, they're key components of healthy soil. And I think they play an, an appreciated role in depressing um, herbivores attacks. And we have very little data. Uh, I think our paper was one of, of the first to to, to draw those relationships and those linkages between those system components. So more has to be done. Um, but through healthy soils, or we can do more than retaining water, retaining nitrogen, sequestering carbon. We can also depress potentially some uh, important pests. And so I think we have an unprecedented opportunity uh, to develop what I'd like to call the next generation of integrated pest management strategies. And they integrate soil and fertility management because most of most of those practices, the nine C's that Scott and Brian implement, it's really it's their soil and fertility management. And it has some impact on integrated pest management. So it will be interesting to rethink integrated pest management and broaden this, broader this, this, this concept to include those soil plant soil microbes interactions. And um, Fostering this beneficial interaction provide all their co-benefits. Cool so there's, there's a lot of, of win here. But I want to put a caveat into that. Um, when, if we want to start managing for microbes, it's going to be extremely, it's going to be difficult because like for income inequality, um, the 1% of microbe is extremely very important and tip up, the, tip up the balance. Uh, you can have 99, on, on other projects we've shown that you can have 99% of the microbial population being exactly the same. Having this 1% shift completely change the ecological functions and um, a relationship between microbes. because some of them can be keystone species that are very important in um, shaping microbial networks and, and how microbes communicate with each other and therefore their outcome. So um, it's, uh, it's going to be interesting and tricky because we're going to have to pay attention to this, to this 1%. But in conclusion, uh, really, we have a lot of um, a lot of interest right now in biostimulants in managing for soil health. We're better understanding soil health. We have comprehensive assessment of soil health coming out, um, and. Um, um, uh, field days, healthy soil programs, CDF and RCS being on, 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 on the ball here. So um, I think an exciting time to build up uh, the opportunities of using our soils for um, uh, uh, mitigating some, some impacts of insect pests and, and decreasing vulnerabilities of our agricultural system to various traces in a simultaneous way. So with that, I'll, I'll thank you. Um, and I'll be happy to answer any question or chit chat about any any questions you you might have. And, and I realize some of it is is very abstract, but um, happy to chat some more. <laughs>